everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is how do we build better products. So the challenge today is not so much about building. We can build lots, lots of stuff these days. The bigger question is this one, which is how do we uncover what defines a better product? Now, in recent years, uh, the Lean Startup has come on the stage. Uh, these lights are in my way. I can't see all of you, but I'm assuming you've all heard of the Lean Startup. Many of you probably practice this uh, in your companies in some fashion. Now, when people think about the Lean Startup, one of two things comes to mind, which is the MVP and this build, measure, learn loop. So in other words, experiments. Um, and the logic here is that we should start with an MVP. So start with something small, because building something that's too big, that takes nine months or a year to get to market, um, something that nobody wants, is really a form of waste. So start with something smaller. Put that in the hands of customers. Go around this build, measure, learn loop um, once or multiple times, and incrementally refine the MVP from there. Now, in theory, all of this makes sense, and this is definitely progress, so we're not spending lots of time building something that isn't right. However, in practice, what I have found is that a lot of MVPs really get stuck. Um, they don't really get you to building the thing that customers want, and the reason is rather simple. So if you look at this build, measure, learn loop, it's like an experiment, so it's like an idea validator. If you put an idea in there, you very quickly learn whether the idea is a good one or a bad one. And if you start with a reasonably good idea, then customers engage with you and they steer you along the way and you get on the right path. And that's when you can pivot and get to something that works. But if you start with something that is completely off base, customers don't turn into testers, they don't give you feedback, they simply leave. So if you're doing this on a landing page, um, they would, you, just, you would just see a high abandonment rate. Um, if you were giving this to your customers, they just wouldn't give you feedback. And so then people get stuck. Um, that starts the chase for the mythical killer feature, where we start throwing out yet more features, yet more value propositions out there in the hope that one of those will stick. But just throwing stuff on the wall is not the right way to pivot. That's just a disguise, see what sticks strategy, and that just doesn't work. And so what we're going to talk about today is this question, which is how do we start with better ideas? What is the prequel to the Lean Startup? So the Lean Startup is great, and I'm a, I'm a big advocate of the Lean Startup for idea validation, but we have to start with something else. We have to start with idea discovery, and more specifically, problem discovery. So when we get hit with an idea, for a lot of us, this is what happens, is we rush to start thinking about solution, we start building out that solution, and we do everything in our power to bring this solution to life only to get into that trap of the build, measure, learn, where we are now just throwing stuff out without feedback, and that doesn't get us anywhere. Starting with the solution is like starting with a key. Um, so we can all, those of us that are, that are in product, that love product, we can all build a beautiful key, we can build a key that's fast, we can build a key that's feature rich, but we don't quite know what customers we necessarily are going after, we don't quite know what problems necessarily we're going after, and that often gets us stuck. A better mindset to develop is to switch this around. And it sounds simple, and that's what we'll be unpacking here, how to do this. But if you focus instead on customers, or in focus instead on problems, and specifically problems worth solving, then key building becomes a lot easier. Uh, once you know the door you want to open, we can start building those keys and go through those doors, which ac actually take us places. And so this is the mindset that I want to kind of unpack further. So in the old world, building solution and throwing it out there used to work because there weren't that many competitors. There weren't that many choices that customers had. And so where would they go? If you launch your first product and it doesn't do well, your customers would talk to you and help you get that back on track. But today, fast forward, thanks to the internet and cloud computing, there are startups and bigger companies coming up with new ideas at a rapid pace. And so today, if you fail to deliver customer value once, twice, your customers don't stick around, they start looking for other options. And so they switch very easily. So we have to level up and we have to start with better ideas and we have to start with better problems worth solving. Now all this sounds like common sense. Um, and the problem, of course, is that we don't find common sense in, in great abundance. Um, and the challenges, of course, are that problems have their inherent challenges. Um, one of the first ones is this innovator's bias. So the innovator's bias 
is where we as product people fall in love with our ideas. This one is hard to shake off. Um, one of the tools that one can use is this Lean Canvas. Maybe with a show of hands, how many of you have been exposed or seen the Lean Canvas before? All right, so I'll just leave this here for a second. Um, and I'll point you to the extreme left and right boxes at the top, customer and problem. So oftentimes, this is a great diagnostic tool. You take your idea and you try to fill this canvas starting with customer and problem. So don't start with the solution box. Try to instead ask, who are the customers we are going to solve for? And what are we solving? So what is the problem that we are really trying to get at? Um, and that's a great diagnostic because oftentimes people realize that they might be thinking just prematurely about the solution. So that's one of the tools. But the challenge with this, of course, is that even though I tell you to forget about the solution, we can't do that. And if you already have decided you're going to build a hammer, then everything starts looking like a nail. And so the challenge we, we have with even filling out the canvas is that we start to invent or fake problems. So instead of asking the question, what problems can I solve for this type of customer, we start asking, what problems can I solve for this customer with my hammer? Um, and we've already injected solution into that, and so everything here gets biased. So we want to avoid that. So we're going to talk about a better way of addressing problems. All right. Um, the other thing that uh, people stumble with is talking to customers. And so we can go and talk to customers, but when we talk to customers, oftentimes we only get surface problems because customers themselves don't quite understand what problems they have. It's the same reason why some of us go to psychologists and therapists is we don't introspectively understand our current situation. And so we need someone else to kind of look in the mirror for us. So customers are not very good resources for giving you root causes. They can tell you all the surface stuff. Um, the other thing that we have when we're talking with customers is if you try to talk to customers about problems, if they don't know you like you trust you yet, they can get very defensive um, because problems are uncomfortable. Uh, they don't open up. They don't want to be vulnerable. And then this is a real problem that those of you that are building desire-driven products run into, which is we can't really talk about problems in desire-driven products using that same vocabulary. You can talk to people about what problem does Angry Birds solve um, or a fashion or a movie. Um, and it's just something more aspirational. The last challenge we have with problems is that customers, too, are solution biased. I know a lot of you here are in products, and so you probably do some backlog grooming. If you actually look at your feature requests and look at them more carefully, a lot of them are really solutions disguised as problems. So a customer might ask for a new feature, or they might ask for a new button, or they might ask for a new report. Those aren't really problems. They are telling you what to build. And if you, have kind of, if you take that forward and build that and give it to them, oftentimes they don't even use it, the people that request it, because it didn't really solve the underlying problem. It didn't get the fundamental job done. So is there a better way? There is, and so let's talk about that. So I'm going to share with you today some newer work that I'm putting out there. It's called The Innovator's Gift, and it has a very simple premise, and that is that when, you, when, we, when we start looking for problems, we start inventing new problems that we want to solve with our great innovative idea, but all the problems are already out there. So instead of looking for new problems, we should be looking for existing problems that are being thrown off as byproducts of old solutions. So I know this may sound a little bit um, uh, strange at first, and so I'll share some examples here to make that more concrete. Fundamentally, we are going to use a backdoor approach. We're not going to start with problems because of all the hot button issues I talked about. We're going to instead start with what people are trying to get done, the outcome they're trying to achieve, or the job they're trying to get done. Uh, maybe with a show of hands, how many of you here are familiar with jobs to be done or exposed to that? So you see a number of hands, I think, going up. Um, now, I uh, first also learned about jobs to be done many years ago. The challenge I had with jobs to be done is that it always felt like magic and like a magic trick. So in retrospect, once you knew the job, you could explain away a lot of the insights that the thought leaders in the jobs to be done world were sharing with you. But how do you get to those, to me, was a little bit of a black hole. And so for the last few years, uh, since writing the first and second books, I have been digging into this. I have read a lot of Bob Moesta's work, uh, Tony Alwick, uh, Clayton Christensen, and really try to unpack what I think makes this more practicable. So we'll be sharing with you today a new canvas and talking about how you use it. But first, I'd like to start with this example. So those of you that aren't that familiar with jobs to be done, 
This is probably a code that many of you have, have seen at some point. Uh, don't build a quarter inch drill bit. Build, uh, sorry, people don't want a quarter inch drill bit, they want a quarter inch hole. And what this is fundamentally trying to get at, this was uh, a quote that was uh, put forward by a Harvard professor back in the 60s, 70s, and he was trying to emphasize the importance of outcomes. So don't think about the tool, which in this case is a drill or the drill bit. That's not what people are buying. There's no desired outcome from just buying a drill bit. Think about what the tool does for you. So think about the finished story benefit. And when you focus on the outcome, which in this case is a quarter inch hole, you can start to observe problems. So for instance, if someone is trying to drill a hole in concrete and the drill bit breaks, then you know that that's a problem. And in that situation, you should make a stronger drill bit. So that's the solution you come up with. And your unique value proposition might be this titanium-based, 40% stronger uh, drill bit. So that's what this allows you to do, is it allows you to go to the outcome people are trying to do. So if someone's requesting a report, don't just build the report. Ask them what are they going to use the report for and kind of understand what it is that they will use the, the thing you're building for. And that helps you define a better feature, or in this case, a better drill bit. Now, I would say that while this moved the, the, uh, the thinking forward, it's still a bit limited. Um, it's limited because I don't think that people really want a quarter inch hole either. Right? So the whole quote was people don't want a quarter inch drill bit, they want a quarter inch hole. This isn't a desired outcome. So this is a solution that has certain problems with it. Um, hopefully you can see these problems. There is the immediate problem of the hole. Um, if, if you're like me, whenever I drill things to hang a painting, or in this case maybe hang some tools in my garage, there is some anxiety there because I don't know if I'm going to drill in the right place. And so I have to measure, I have to remeasure before I make the first hole. I don't have an undo button. And so that's a bit challenging, so I have to make sure that I'm drilling the right, in the right place. So that's problem number one. Uh, the, the other problem is these shavings. When the drill bit uh, works, it's going to drop off some shavings. I have to go inside, get a sweeper and mop or whatever to kind of pick that up. Um, and that's kind of a, a, another kind of undesired outcome that I don't really care about. Um, the last problem here is this latent problem. So I have a hole in my wall. Now, in the short term, the bigger job I'm trying to get done here is maybe hang some tools in the garage shed, because this is plywood. So that's probably what I'm trying to get done. So I'll hang my tools, and the hole will be covered up. So problem solved. But one day, if I decide to move my tools to a different place, I now have this ugly hole staring at me. And so I have to take another trip to the hardware store, get some patch, and fix that hole up, maybe paint it up, or do whatever I need to to cover that up. So these are problems. Um, and this is the example of an existing solution which gets the job done, spitting out problems. Now, what if I could give you a solution that was cheaper, that could get the job done without all this mess? Would you be interested? And that's what this kind of innovation is fundamentally about. And that's what 3M did. So 3M invented and put this to, brought this to market. This is a mounting tape that allows you to hang all kinds of stuff just using tape, so using this mounting tape. So 30 pounds, 40 pounds, they have different versions of these. And so if you were hanging tools in the garage, you didn't have to go buy a drill or a drill bit. You could go and buy one of these things. Um, and so this would be a much better solution. It gets the same job done, and it doesn't have the mess problem. It doesn't have the hole problem. I'm sure, I'm sure this has its own set of issues. Maybe if you move, take out the mounting tape, you've got glue residue that you have to clean up. But it's, it's, it's better and cheaper than the other alternative. And surprisingly, it's placed next to the drill bit. So if you go to the hardware store, um, 3M competes against the drill bit in this particular situation. So this is the kind of thinking that we want to instill. Um, and how do we get to that is really what I want to talk about next. So how do you take your product and get it to the same kind of insights that 3M got with the mounting tape and knowing what they were really competing against? So the way we do this is we start, again, by studying how people are trying to get things done. And don't focus in on the job right off the start. Try to really uncover what solutions they are using today and what problems are they really spitting out. And then we have a three-step process. So we want to get out of the building. We want to discover problems worth solving. We want to then assemble possible solutions to those problems. And we don't quite know if they're going to work or not. So we test that. And that's where the Lean Startup really shines. We can go and do a lot of offer testing. But these are anchored against existing problems, not new problems. And then we want to turn this into what I like to call a mafia offer. So a mafia offer, if you watch the movie The Godfather, is an offer your customers simply cannot refuse, not because you stronghold them, but because it's so compelling. 
So it's so compelling because it resonates with your customers. The value proposition is super clear. The problems that you're talking about are things they are living. So if, you've ever, if you have ever drilled a hole in your garage shed, you knew exactly about those problems. So I don't have to explain it to you. And then when I share with you a solution like the mounting tape, maybe some of you will go off and buy that because it seems appealing. Um, and that would be how I would test. So I can test the offer, and if that converts, then we go and build the MVP. So that's kind of a high level of what that process looks like. So there is a newer canvas, and it's kind of busy, so we're going to unpack this um, step by step. So some of you may have ex been exposed to these forces, uh, these, these forces, customer forces, those of you that, that are familiar with jobs to be done, as specifically uh, Bob Moesta's work. Uh, we did an early collaboration together, and so we worked together, um, and I kind of redrew this picture and, and added some more elements to it. So let's unpack that a little, a, a little bit. The way I like to talk about jobs is using this ladder. So many of you may be familiar with the Maslow's Pyramid. Um, whether you use it or not doesn't really matter. The point I want to get across is that from the moment we are born, we have certain jobs to be done. And we start at the bottom of this, this pyramid and climb our way up. So when you were a baby even, you had to be fed. Um, so you would cry and you would essentially hire your parents to feed you. That was the way you communicated. As we got a bit older, we started to do other things. Some of you cook, some of you go to restaurants. Um, so we have, we, have, we have hired different products to do those jobs for us. Um, some of you, to get around, use public transportation, other car ride sharing, other bicycle, other cars. So th that job is met. Um, so as you can go up this pyramid, the jobs kind of evolve with time, and we go up and become more aspirational. You're all here. You're hiring this conference to get better, literally, in your, in your other jobs. Um, so that's, again, why you're here. You're here to learn and apply some of these techniques um, that, that resonate with you. So that's kind of how, the, how jobs come into existence. But at any given point in time, we have a set number of things that we work with. We're not here constantly buying stuff. We're not here constantly switching stuff. We have a set of things we go to. So you're not buying cars all the time. You're not looking for new ways to do things. So we are in a state of status quo. So at any given point in time, you are here listening to me. You aren't here buying stuff. So you are in a state of status quo. So we're not really doing any buying and selling. And what this canvas allows us to do is really unpack the forces that cause change. So let's, let's see what happens. So this is the first law of customer motion, which is once you have hired certain products to do certain jobs, you're going to be uh, you know, driven by habit. We're all creatures of habit. You're not going to be changing a lot of things drastically until something happens. And that's something, and that's the first thing that starts things off, is a triggering event. Now, a triggering event um, is not just a, a simple event. It's an event that creates some kind of an expectation violation. So I'll give you an example. So let's say after this conference, I'm meeting some friends for drinks. I show up at the bar, and the first friend is there, and he's talking about this new car that he bought. And he's super excited and goes on for five minutes about the car, and I'm happy for him, and he's talking about how these cars don't have any keys anymore, and you know, they're more fuel efficient. His old car was seven years old, and he's so happy with this new car. Well, then the second friend comes over 10 minutes later, and she too has bought a new car, and then the two go at it for another 15 minutes. Third friend comes over, and guess what? He too has bought a new car. I don't know about you, but my car, which was perfectly fine an hour ago, now starts to feel old. That's an example of a triggering event. As I drive home that night, I'm on the highway, I start to notice other cars on the road. They've always been there, but my perception vision is now more acute for looking at new cars. Um, I look at billboards, I start paying attention to advertising, and so I have moved into this state of passive looking, where I'm considering the possibility of maybe getting rid of my seven-year-old car. Um, so that creates this motivation for the desired outcome. You know, my car is seven years old, you know, I'm doing okay, I've got a good job, maybe I should go and buy this new car as well, all my friends are doing it. Now, for every one of those motivations for change, there is an equal and opposite resistance for change. Um, and we call this inertia or comfort of the old way. Now, a car is a major purchase. Um, I'm not just going to, on the whim of my friends buying cars, go off the next day and pick a car off, the, off, the, off a dealer's lot because it's a big investment. Um, it's a big expense. I probably have my old car paid off. Um, getting into a loan is an anxiety I don't want to get into. And so I talk myself out of it. Um, and so this kind of is where people get stuck. So this is where the push is not yet big enough for them to start looking for options, and we are just in this passive mode until something else happens. So these triggering events are sometimes reoccurring. 
let's say next week my car breaks down. And this is the third time it's happened in the last two months. So I go back to my mechanic and I said, hey, what happened? This car broke down again. And he tells me that, yes, we failed to find uh, this, en this, this engine oil leak and we have got all these pistons that, are, that need to be replaced. In fact, we probably should just change your entire engine um, and that's going to be ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. At that point, that triggering event forces me to then move into the next stage because now my push of the situation is much greater than that resistance, that comfort of the old way. I don't want my old car anymore because it's now no longer good enough. What's at stake is that I'm going to put all this money in and it could still break down. And so I don't want to do that. And so now I move up to the next stage here, which is the consideration stage. And I start looking at options. Now, I might not stop at just the same car. I may not even stay within the same brand. I might start looking at other types of cars. You know, hybrids are possibilities, electrics are possibilities. Tesla has you know, launched their, their Model 3 now. So maybe I might start considering shifting from my old car to an electric car. I might not even stay within cars. I might say, well, if I'm in a big city like San Francisco or New York, the car is actually a problem because I have to pay for parking, I have to find parking, that all takes time. Maybe I could just live off ride sharing, or maybe I could just live off the subway or metro, or I could be healthy and use bicycle for most of the things and then supplement with other things. So that's when we start considering a bunch of different options. And the point to raise here is that your competition is not often within the same category. I talk to a lot of startups, and many startups build their products and think they have no competition. That's because they define it in terms of their category or their technology, and that's not the way to think about it. I find more startups get killed by email and spreadsheets than another startup or another product. So if you're building collaboration software or if you're building, um, if you're building productivity software, analytics software, a lot of what people are using today are email and spreadsheets, and that's your true competition. That's what you're trying to cause people to switch away from. So that's kind of a, what, what we need to realize here. So your true competition is whatever your customers begin to consider when they have been triggered. So in this case, as I said, I might consider a bunch of different things. They all will have, again, a tug of war. They all will have a certain pull. Um, and this will be their value proposition. So ride sharing has a certain value proposition. You don't have to worry about parking. You know, pay as you go. Uh, you don't have all this, this investment of having a car, owning a car. Uh, but it also has friction, anxiety. What if I am not able to find the, a, a ride share when I need it in the right time? Um, what if uh, I, I have to go further away and you, what do I do then if I'm taking a trip? So those are all the anxieties that people come into. So this again is a tug of war that customers go through and eventually they're going to pick one product. So the one that they pick is where the pull again is greater than the friction um, and the combined push and pull gets people up to where they buy a particular product. Now what's also interesting to point out here is that people will sometimes keep multiple products around and so even though they start moving up this hill with one product, they always have the old product as a backup. Now, this is not always the case, but in, in the example I gave, I might keep my old car for a while, do some ride-sharing experiments, you know, try it for a week or two, see if I can live off of that exclusively, and if I can't, then I know that that wouldn't work for me. So people do these types of trials, and so the thing to realize here is that they sometimes use multiple products simultaneously, and all these forces are working up against them. Um, they'll eventually get the, you know, put one particular product, the job done, and then they ask themselves, you know, was that better than the old solution? And if it was, they might hire this new product, and that new product becomes a new status quo. So if I get rid of my old car and I decide ride sharing wasn't the right thing, but I want to go electric, I try that out for a while, maybe do a test drive, and then I buy that car, that has now become my new status quo. I'm not next week going to go looking for another car because I'm now stuck with this car. So that's what we want to really unpack. So in the way we use this canvas is rather than going and pitching your solution, trying to get it in the hands of customers, if you can instead go and talk to them and unpack these forces, understand how, how they are being used, you can apply them for all kinds of growth possibilities within your business. So you can apply them to get more customers, that's what acquisition is, keep your customers longer, retention, or use your customers to get new customers' referrals, just by playing off of these forces. So I'm going to focus today just on one of those. We're going to talk about acquisition and how do you really cause switch. Um, so if you believe in what I've talked about so far, 
every time people are triggered, there is always an old solution, an old way of doing things, and then they're moving to a new way. And so innovation, acquisition, is fundamentally about causing switch. And that's a way to kind of think about it. So I'm going to share with you some tactics for doing it, and we're going to focus on just one of them, um, just one of the, the, the elements today, and then the others I'll kind of talk, to, talk, talk through at the end. Now, when we, when we try to acquire customers, a common practice is to try to build a persona of your customers, because if you don't know who you're trying to attract, it's hard to build marketing, it's hard to build messaging for them. And so we build these rich personas, uh, but I'm not a huge fan of them at the early stages. And the reason is because we don't yet know who our customers are, and we're doing a lot of guesswork. We're building all these rich profiles, they're fun, we can put names to them, we can come up with all these attributes, but there are too many attributes to build an effective campaign around. There are too many attributes to do Facebook targeting or Google targeting around, and you're just throwing a bunch of stuff out there. So that's not a very effective way. Um, the art of the early adopter definition is not hundreds of attributes, but rather having as few attributes as possible that really distinguish people that aren't customers from people that are customers. And one of the common threads, if you kind of follow the customer journey or the buyer journey story I shared with you, is that people who buy things have had a triggering event. And that's what I want to talk about fundamentally today, is that if you can identify triggering events, you are going to be in a much better position than all your competition because you can show up before they do. So let's see how this plays out. So if you were running uh, a business where you, had, you were selling mattresses and these mattresses were good for back pain, when would be the best time of day to run an ad for that? And you can just shout out some answers. Midnight, morning, so those are, those, are the, those are the two that I heard and those are the common two that I often hear. And those are good times. So midnight is when people are about to go to bed so they know the problem is gonna occur. Morning is good, even better I would say because people have, have probably struggled through a sleepless night and so in the morning they're like, I'm done, I need to go and solve this problem. That's a triggering event. The only problem is that in, mor in the morning time, you have many other jobs to do. You have to get to work. If you have kids, you have to get them ready to work. There's no time to buy anything. So a much better time, and this is an actual case study from a mattress company that sells the most number of mattresses between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. So that's an example of the triggering event when the problem happens and there's really no competition. So if it's 2 a.m. at night, you can't sleep, you're gonna be up in, up in your bed, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna go online uh, on the internet, maybe start browsing, or you're gonna turn on the TV. And if you turn on the TV, if you see this infomercial, which magically appears, of course, not magic, it was placed there, and for the next two hours, they talk about this mattress and how it's great for back pain, and there's testimonial after testimonial. Every half an hour, the, pl the price is being slashed. You watch the whole infomercial, and by the end, you're just helpless. This is a mafia offer. You can't resist, you just buy. Um, and you wake up the next morning and you tell your partner, your significant other, guess what, I bought a mattress last night, it'll be here in two weeks, right? So it wasn't, it's in your mind an impulsive buy, but it wasn't really impulsive. It was well placed and it was targeting a triggering event which was reoccurring and you reached that point where you had to do something, right? So this is an example of how just using a triggering event, you can get to um, uh, place your product in front of the right type of customer. Notice in that one, I don't care about the gender, the age of the person, I'm just going after the triggering event. So I'm just going after someone who is sleeping and has this triggering event of back pain, so they can't sleep at night. When is the worst time in the year to run ads for new homes? So let's assume you're a builder. Um, again, throw out some answers. I know some of you were in the workshop yesterday, this is something you saw earlier, but throw out some answers, or I'll, I'll kind of say that for a lot of people, the answers I often hear is during the holidays. So during the holidays, no one's really buying homes, right? Here in the US, after Thanksgiving, really, maybe after Halloween, people start bringing their houses off the market, and they go into the holiday season because they're, they're busy with their family, so no one's really buying homes. What if I tell you that this is actually the best time, the holiday period is the best time to run ads? Uh, because again, there's no competition, and you can run a different type of ad. So to kind of see that, we'll look at this customer journey and I'll focus in on some of the places where it's really not good to run ads. So a lot of people just throw ads based on personas, so demographics, psychographics, uh, but if you are really trying to attract people based on that, you sometimes hit because there's no triggering event there. There's no compelling reason for them to buy from you. So if you throw an ad out to somebody who recently bought a home, they might hit your persona but because they bought a home, they're not going to turn around and buy another home. So that's actually the worst person you want to target. 
So just throwing random ads out, not so good. You want to target those triggering events. So don't just throw random ads out. Um, a lot of good salespeople try to operate at that stage, so between the consideration set and selection. And for a lot of people, they would say, in the holidays, since no one is really looking for homes, that's not a good time. Let's wait till you know, mid-January or February once kids are back in school. That's when people start searching for homes. That's when we should advertise. And that's the classic thinking. But somebody else, Bob Moesta in this case, in his, one of his previous lives, he was actually building uh, homes, and he didn't want to advertise when everyone else was, because what happens at that stage is people are considering you against all the other competition out there. So it's not just you, the only builder, but you are now competing against all the builders out there. You're competing against apartments and condominiums and maybe other options for, that people have when they're looking at switching homes. And that's a very crowded space, lots of direct competition. So the absolute best time is to really go even earlier. So Bob Moesta went out um, in March and April one year, and he began to interview people. So much like I'm advocating, he went to interview people who had recently bought homes, not to convert them and turn them into customers of his, but rather to learn from them. Um, so he went and talked to them, and what he found out was that the triggering event, he wasn't interested in when they bought, because he could tell that that's how he targeted them. They bought in March, April. But the triggering event happened much, much sooner. If you can guess, the triggering event actually happened during the holidays. And why did it happen during the holidays? Because that year, that family happened to host lots of other family, external family in their home around Thanksgiving or Christmas. And that's when their home, which was perfectly fine for the two of them or the four of them, grew smaller. Right? So this is, when you have, this is when you have extended family in your home. You begin to realize that cousins are getting bigger. Before, you're, you're all, all the kids could share beds. Now they can't. So people are all over, sprawled all over the floor. They're on the couches. Um, it's very crowded. So that's when the triggering event really happens. And so at that point is where people begin to passively look. And if someone like a builder can appear magically on some passive searches and not sell them, but begin to build awareness, begin to talk about other things like, you know, switching homes or loan rates, interest rates, how do you make the move, um, how do you upgrade or downgrade, you know, what are the options, that's the kind of ads he was running. And come January or February, he built a very healthy pipeline of customers, but he did this at a, at a time when there was no competition, right? So that's what's the magic of going after the triggering event, because if the triggering event happens and you show up there, your customers haven't yet decided what they're going to buy. They're still in that phase where they are fighting push and inertia. And if you can begin to target them, when they make that jump, you become the favorite. Some of you are probably in B2B, and I always get this question of how does this apply there. Go and talk to your salespeople, and some of your better salespeople do a lot of lead nurturing. And some of the even better ones, some of your best salespeople, do this before people are looking for solutions. If you're responding to RFPs, if you aren't the first one that was already the favorite, then you are really going up against a lot of direct competition. Chances are that that company has already picked a favorite, and they're only doing the RFP process to try to justify the favorite. They want to make sure they're not making a mistake. They want to justify that nothing else is out there that is you know, blatantly obvious that they didn't catch before. So you aren't really the favorite, and that's an unfair advantage for the favorite, because as long as they're good enough, they're going to get that account. So responding to RFPs, I know some of you may do that, to me not as, as effective. If you can instead get to the point before the RFP and start establishing a relationship with a customer and even educate them, get them to start thinking of problems, um, and of course magically you have a solution in your back pocket, you don't start pitching that, you really start helping them with their problem, that's a more effective way of getting that customer. So today I really focused on acquisition, but we can apply this technique for retention referrals. I'll talk about some of the, some of the ways to do that. So retention is fundamentally about switch, and so, what, so, so it's, it's fundamentally about preventing switch. And so one of the things that you would do there is, again, try to remove the inertia and friction of your own product. Because if you don't uncover problems in your product, guess what? Your competition can do the same thing. They can go and study your customers and ask them what they like, don't like about your product, and then begin to anchor against that. So they could anchor against that and switch away from you. And so the best defense against that is to really get the job done, to over time get more jobs done for your customers. It's the reason why when you do a Google map search, Google connects you to Uber or Lyft. So if you want to, to, to get a ride, they do it. It's not because they get a commission or an affiliate based on that. It's just they're being helpful. 
Um, if you search for the airport, they tell you when to leave for the airport so you don't miss your flight. Again, they are trying to be that more helpful map uh, service that goes beyond other maps so it creates more stickiness. So the more jobs that you can do for your customers, the better off you are. Now you do have to, of course, be careful. You can't take on all the jobs in the world, so there is some scoping that needs to be done. The other kind of thing out there, some of you may be familiar with uh, some of the work that Nir Ayal or Charles Duhigg have done on the habit loop, um, trying to build habits into your products, trying to make your products be habit forming is a very powerful idea because if people, if you become the new status quo, if people are now using your product out of habit, that's again a very powerful uh, engine of retention. Um, all things being equal, people don't leave incumbent solutions unless there's that expectation violation. So if once you've picked a grocery store, once you've picked your mobile company, once you've picked your TV company, unless they screw up multiple times, you're probably going to stick with them. That's just the nature of how, how we operate. Um, so that's some, some, some things to think about there. Now you can apply the same canvas, and instead of interviewing now people using other solutions, interview your own customers. So we talk to a lot of our own customers, people who sign up. We want to understand why they hired us, you know, who they fired, so where, what were they using before, what job are they trying to do, and we try to align our onboarding with that particular goal. When they leave us, we want to, again, do some interviews. We want to understand why they left, um, where are they going to, and is it because we did a poor job or because we were done with the job? Because sometimes that's perfectly fine. If you, if you hire a painter, and the painter leaves after two weeks, you're not going to be crying after him or her and say, come back and stay longer. Um, the job was done, and they're going to leave, and you're going to thank them and probably give them referrals um, if the job was done well. And that's what you want to do. So you want to talk to people who are canceling or leaving. Make sure that they are leaving happily. And if they are, ask for a referral. So that kind of gets into that, that third piece there. So hopefully this was some, some insights. Uh, I, so there's the whole Canvas. Uh, there is a link here if you want to go and check out more details. You can download the Canvas here. There's also some other content here. There's a group that we have, which is a practitioner's group. If any of this piqued your interest, you can check out that link. Um, we'll also have slides that will go out um, to all of you, so you'll have all these slides as well. So hopefully that gave you some insights. Even if you took one thing from this talk, um, I would say triggering events is key. So if you can even uncover triggering events that cause people to start considering products, not to buy, but the first thought, if you can uncover that, that puts you in a much more powerful place to be able to position your products and then start to uncover those problems from there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.